Well, good morning and welcome to the City Planning Commission public meeting. Madam Secretary, let's begin. Good morning. This is a City Planning Commission public meeting held at NYC City Planning Commission hearing room, Lower Concourse 120 Broadway. Today is Wednesday, August 22nd, 2018. As a courtesy during the proceedings, we ask that you please turn off all cell phones and beepers. All speakers should fill out a speaker's card. In addition, we ask that those providing testimony please identify yourself, limit your remarks to three minutes, and speak clearly into the microphone. I will now call the roll. <coughs> Chair Lago? Here. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Here. Commissioner Capelli? Commissioner Cerullo? Here. Commissioner De La Us? Here. Commissioner Dweck? Here. Commissioner Edy? Commissioner Efron? Here. Commissioner Knight? Here. Commissioner Levin? Here. Commissioner Marin? Here. Commissioner Ortiz? Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of Wednesday, <coughs> August 8, 2018. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Minutes are approved. <coughs> Scheduling. On calendar numbers 1 through 12, we have resolutions for adoption. Scheduling Wednesday, September 5, 2018, for a public hearing to be held at NYC City Planning Commission hearing room, Lower Concourse 120 Broadway. On the resolution, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Resolutions are adopted. The calendar is the report section on page 10. Borough of the Bronx, calendar number 13, CD 10, N180398BDX. In the matter of an application concerning the formation of the Trosnex Bridge, I'm sorry, Trosnex Business Improvement District for a favorable report on calendar number 13. <coughs> Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Delos? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 13. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 14, CD2, N180396BDM. In the matter of an application concerning the formation of the Hudson Square Amended Business Improvement District. For a favorable report on calendar number 14, Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. I'd like to thank the bid for its noticeable difference it's made in the area already. Okay. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 14. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 15, CD4, C180273, ZSM, in the matter of an application for the grant of a special permit concerning 116 West 23rd Street, Burlington sign. For a favorable report on calendar number 15, Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner, Co Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 15. Bar of Manhattan, calendar numbers 16 and 17. Calendar number 16, CD5, C180263, ZSM. Calendar number 17, C180264, ZSM. In the matter of applications for the grant of special permits concerning 110 East 16th Street. For favorable reports on calendar numbers 16 and 17, Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Recuse. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Uh, while continuing to believe, uh, while continuing to disagree with the conclusion of the Adorama um, uh, application that we handled a year or so ago. I, I continue to believe that an affordable housing commitment ought to apply here. Um, I'm very pleased that the applicant has um, volunteered to find a way to support um, the cause of affordable housing in this neighborhood, um, and I vote yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers 16 and 17. Borough of Manhattan, calendar numbers 18, 19, and 20. Calendar number 18, CD2, N170115, ZRM. Calendar number 19, C170116, ZSM. Calendar number 20, C170117, ZSM. 
in the matter of applications for a zoning tax amendment and for the grant of special permits concerning 27 East 4th Street. For favorable reports on calendar numbers 18, 19, and 20. Chair Largo. I'd like to preface my vote by noting one of the salubrious effects of a public review process, which is the attention that it brought to this gem that we have in our city, the Merchant House Museum. And I want to particularly commend the cooperation, um, above and beyond cooperation, from both the Parks Department and the Department of Buildings. And the fact that there is this much public attention, government attention, gives me comfort that we will both see a building proceed on the site that will enhance the streetscape, but at the same time, preserve this gem. And with that, I vote yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Uth? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Uh, yes, and I'd like to associate myself with the uh, comments of the chair. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Uh, I share that chair's appreciation, particularly that the Department of Parks and Recreation has recognized its responsibility as the building owner here. So, in fact, I don't think it's above and beyond. I think it's requ what's required um, of the neighboring property owner. But I'm glad that um, Department of Parks is uh, at the table. Um, certainly glad that Buildings is paying attention to this. Um, reassured that the Landmarks Preservation Commission did take into account um, the uh, potential effects of this new development on the neighboring building. Um, with fingers crossed that all goes well and that the 1830s plaster holds, I vote yes. <laughs> Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers 18, 19, and 20. Borough of Queens, calendar number 21, CD7, C180, 285 PCQ in the matter of an application for site selection and acquisition of property concerning the NYPD 112 <coughs> Street parking park and lease. For a favorable report on calendar number 21, Chair Lago. Yes. <coughs> Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Delos. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 21. <coughs> Borough of Queens, calendar number 22, CD 10, C180304, ZMQ. In the matter of an application for a zoning map amendment concerning Lefferts Boulevard rezoning. For a favorable report on calendar number 22. <coughs> Chair Largo? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Uth? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 22. Borough of Queens, calendar numbers 23 through 27. <coughs> calendar number 23, CD2, C180386 PPQ. Calendar number 24, C180384ZSQ. Calendar number 25, C180385 PPQ. Calendar number 26, C180382 ZSQ. Calendar number 27, <coughs> C180383 ZSQ. In the matter of applications for the disposition of city owned property and for the grant of special permits concerning 26 32 and 2701 Jackson Avenue. For favorable reports on calendar numbers 23 through 27, Chair Largo? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Uth? I'm gonna vote yes, but I... Um I'm going to vote yes, but I do believe that this is an opportunity to achieve deeper affordability, um, and I would recommend that that, that, that the council um, look to modify to have option one be the primary option. With that, I vote yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers 23, 24, 25, 26, and 27. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number 28, CD2, C170178, ZMR. In the matter of an application for a zoning map amendment concerning 3122-3136, Victory Boulevard rezoning. For a favorable report on calendar number 28, <coughs> Chair Largo. Before casting my vote, I want to note that we received a particularly troubling letter from the council for the applicant. 
In the letter, it refers to the fact that um, the city council member has certain concerns. Um, it then goes on to note that the, um, the change that was requested, um, an ups or a change in zoning, came with certain size um, sign um, opportunities, and that somehow the applicant's lawyer thought it was the responsibility of the Department of City Planning to flag that a council member would have political difficulties with these sign um, requirements or <clears throat> sign possibilities. I take the deepest exception to this. Um, when one selects a zoning district, competent council are able to determine what is permitted, what is not permitted, and the fact that the applicant, the applicant's counsel have a political difficulty is not a land use matter that is appropriately before this commission. Despite that, despite these concerns, I do think that the change in zoning is appropriate as a land use matter, and so vote yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? So this application makes it so obvious that everything that we do here, no matter how big and all-encompassing or how small and seemingly insignificant, impacts our communities and therefore requires our deepest and most thoughtful consideration. A simple rezoning of three separately owned, relatively small properties has led to a great deal of discussion on long-term implications of our actions, particularly the limited authority we possess even even when those implications may be triggered by our own actions. That's both enlightening about the land use process and telling of our work. And while not the subject directly of our actions today, an issue I do believe is ripe for further review. More to come on that, I hope. But there is no question that on its face, supporting a longstanding family-owned business is a no-brainer for any community, never mind a community where family-owned small businesses have been and continue to be the backbone of its economy and its economic history and the fabric of its surroundings. But as we well know, as participants in the process of government, the devil is always in the details, and that was certainly the case here. By granting the zoning change, the door will be open to unintended as of right consequences that could devastate the character of the neighboring neighborhood. And the rezoning also opened the door to address long ignored improvements to the transportation network of one of Staten Island's busiest commercial intersections. How this could have turned out would have been anyone's guess. But the borough president's concerns and those of this commission were legitimately tackled by the applicant, which I express my appreciation for. First, for the commitment made to the borough by choosing to make a home there and for also creating a business there and looking to expand. And secondly, for working to address the issues raised during this public review process. While I realize the two primary issues are not yet completely resolved, I cite the commitments and assurances made in the most recent letter to the Commission on the matters relating to the restrictive declaration and uh, pertaining to signage and the road widening, critical issues of our borough president and of mine, which are both acknowledged in the applicant's letter. And I am aware that these issues will need to be finalized prior to council action for this application to make its way through the entire Euler process successfully, as was indicated in the letter that you Madam Chair referenced. For me, in this phase of the process, those commitments and assurances and my understanding that the ultimate approval would only be granted if these issues are resolved, while not the way I believe this process should work, it nonetheless provides me some sense of comfort to support this application. And I want to thank the Staten Island office staff and the central staff for all the work they did to get us to this point today. So with that, I vote aye. Commission, <coughs> Commissioner Dela Uth? Yes. Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner <coughs> Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 28. <coughs>
Bar of Staten Island, calendar numbers 29, 30, and 31. Calendar number 29, CD1, N180090, ZAR. Calendar number 30, N180091, ZAR. Calendar number 31, N180092, ZAR. In the matter of applications for the grant of authorizations concerning 243 Howard Avenue. For adoption on calendar numbers 29, 30, and 31. Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Delaus? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Calendar numbers 29, 30, and 31 have been adopted. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number 32, CD3, N180328, RCR. In the matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 245 Edge Grove Avenue. For adoption on calendar number 32, Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Dela Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Calendar number 32 has been adopted. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number 33. <coughs> CD3 N180424 RCR in the matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 470 Rensselaer Avenue for adoption on calendar number 33. <laughs> Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Delaus? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Calendar number 33 has been adopted. <coughs> Bar of Staten Island, calendar numbers 34 and 35. Calendar number 34, CD1, N170215, ZAR. Calendar number 35, N170216, ZAR. In the matter of applications for the grant of authorizations concerning 131, 133, and 137, and 139, Brighton Avenue. For adoption on calendar numbers 34 and 35. <coughs> Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Delaus? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Calendar numbers 34 and 35 have been adopted. The next part of the calendar is the public hearing section on page 25. Borough of the Bronx, calendar number 36. <clears throat> CD 9C180460 PCX, a public hearing in the matter of an application for the site selection and acquisition of property concern, concerning DOHMH, Mobile Food Ven Vendor Inspection Facility. We will have a 10 minute team presentation by Sally Yap, James Middleton, and Erica Peralta. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, unfortunately, Jim is caught up in a, a, a train with a train delay. He ho hopes to make it by 10:30, so I will hold the fort. And Erica here is from our IG's office. So, um, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene is um, had uh, been in search of a mobile food uh, ins vendor inspection facility throughout the city for the last 10 years. Uh, we currently uh, have um, the um, operations uh, con conducted at, um, at a garage that we use for our you know, vehicles and it's in, in, uh, very inadequate. Uh, and with the Department of Health uh, new um, or, or more recently adopted um, up, uh, needs to have more extensive <laughs> inspections of all mobile food vending units in the city, we are also uh, planning to uh, um, include the letter grading system that restaurants 
ha have now, so the all mo mobile food vending carts will um, have have the, these uh, grading sis, uh, grading um, on them. So it it really we really need a, a, a larger and better facility. And after thorough search through the Department of Citywide uh, Administration, we found this facility in 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 the Bronx. It is uh, we will have a 20 year lease on this site. Uh, we are currently holding a license with the landlord in order to hold our place in the system pending the Euler process. Uh, at this point, we have gone through uh, this, the, you know, all, you know, the community board approvals and everybody seems to be in, in support of this. Our operations uh, folks have committed to working very closely with the community, uh, with, uh, you know, and and um, that's how it is. So um, I would like to present. I, I have to figure out how to uh, forward this. So the site is at uh, Zuri, on, on the corner of Zuriga Avenue and Ellis Avenue um, in the um, in the Bronx. And the reason why this facility is uh, so. Uh, perfect for us is that it is a, it allows us to have a through uh, traffic throughout the building so that when um, mobile food carts pull into our site, they can be queued um, on, on the parking lot and also go straight through to the facility for, um, for inspection. Um, we will have seven un um, uh, uh, base for the inspection site, each with with its own, um, you know, facilities for inspecting, and the site will have 27 uh, staff in two shifts. So there'll be, you know, some of them would be administrative, and there'll be seven inspectors, as you know, throughout the site. Um, we will be very clear in. Um, um, in, in pushing the traffic without, you know, having a huge queuing on the street, we we also are planning to uh, to as soon as we have a lease signed, we will be doing renovations to the building in order to put in um, the uh, put in the the uh, necessary exhaust systems for for such a facility. We are. Well, Planning also to to have uh, uh, plant trees on on the frontage for you know for sound um, barriers for for the community and and in general we are you know very uh, aware of how you know how we would impact the community and and the, that we are in a, in a neighborhood that has people's homes and you know we're very uh, aware of that but this this site actually works so perfectly for us where we were, you know, and after so many years of, of search, we, we feel like we're very close to the end of, of, of this the process. Um, um, and uh, I guess I, you know, if there are any questions from, from the commission, you know. We'll actually have questions after the um, entirety okay. of the team presentation. Right, okay. So, uh, in, and from our, um, from our point of view, what we will be doing is to, to um, as we said, include, um, um, we will also be uh, putting in tracking systems on, on all the, the carts so that, uh, the, you know, our, our staff can, can know where everybody is, where all the, all the mobile food vendors are, because currently there, there are issues with, with people um, um, not being parked at their, you know, license uh, location. Um, we also will be, um, you know, working with the facility, with everybody else in the, in the community to, to, to do that. 
to get our site together. Um, at, at this point, I think that's at my, you Did know. Did Ms. Peralta Downing also want to make some comments, or you're there for questions? She's yeah. here for questions. Great. Yeah. And, so, and I, you know, not having Jim here, uh, you know, I, I will speak as much as I can to the, op I'll answer as much as I can on operational issues, but I'm, I'm here as the facilities uh, person and I will be uh, managing the, you know, my staff will be managing the renovations of the facility once we have the lease and. Uh, okay, questions from the commission? Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that there'll be seven bays in this in this new facility yes and uh, in our write-ups here it is yeah uh, in yeah. our write-ups it says that um inspections are expected to last approximately 50 to 75 minutes is that per vehicle per vehicle but that's the the maximum amount of time as and as i understand it you know you can get an icy cart that comes in and it may take them 15 minutes to inspect this uh the the cart whereas a big you know bigger <laughs> food uh mobile food um a uh, truck might require the full 50 minutes. So, and they are here on um, uh, on appointment. So they're right appointment only. Appointment yeah. only. Yeah. Okay. So um, there's no there's there's nobody who's going to be you know here, here. comes Jim. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's and nobody going to be you know or hardly anybody going to be. Uh, Queuing yeah, up and waiting and to be. Uh, yeah. Okay. Jim, how, many, Jim, how many? Just let me yeah. follow up. How okay. many uh, vehicles do you anticipate uh, looking at each day? Uh, we anticipate no more than two per time slot, and no more than about six or seven time slots per day. So fourteen at max. Okay. Yeah. And this is a uh, central air. Uh, uh, air conditioned facility or will be? It will be a facility with. If you could speak into the microphone as we. As yeah, Connell it gets. will be a facility with uh, a full exhaust system with. Central air will be in the office area. Uh, the open queue, the, the, the inspection site will have, you know, uh, uh, an exhaust system with, with, uh, with all the sense, um, you know, carbon monoxide sensors and uh, what it was. Are it the night? trucks idling while they're, they're not idling? No, they're, they're not idling. Yeah. They're, they're, they're off, turned off and. Yeah. Everything will be turned off. Um, they use house power for any equipment that they need. <laughs> Yeah. So. And the waiting area will be? Oh, yeah. The waiting area is an enclosed site, is an enclosed office, and the office area will be fully air conditioned. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Marin. Good morning. So I wanted to um, mention that in the borough president's report, he identified the fact that this uh, facility is close proximity to the residential district um, in this neighborhood, and he mentioned this uh, the possibility of some sort of planting of trees between the two. Has that consideration been? Yes, we have committed to that, and that will be part of our renovations plans. Thank we, you. Yeah. Appreciate it. As well as uh, uh, the uh, borough president's office also recommended that we we, we uh, replace the existing chain link fence with a better looking fence. So we're looking at that as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Commissioner Efron. Yes, um, could you just remind us of the hours of operation um, and uh, only because you mentioned the GPS or some sort of a, uh, tracking of those, will that be information that's available to the public? Uh, Eight o'clock to about five o'clock will be the general operating mm -hmm. hours. And will the GPS be available to the public to know where to find carts? Uh, uh, no, we're only gonna use the GPS just to locate carts for inspections only. Ah. <laughs> Seems like a missed opportunity. <laughs> That's commentary, not a question. I apologize. <laughs> Commissioner Cirillo. Good morning. Just a, a question, and I know you, you mentioned this um, in your remarks, but just maybe this is a clarification. So obviously the number of bays available for inspections have really nearly doubled from your current location to this new proposed yeah, location tripled, actually. and I tripled so and I know you mentioned seven inspectors I'm just trying to get an idea are they are those seven inspectors 
working each day or is it seven inspectors who then have different hours I'm just trying to figure out whether or not the number of bays available are actually being used during the day or they're just available but the expectation of the number of inspections that would be done would be less so it's an issue of staffing is it new staffing or do you have the staff already there and will they be will those bays be used during the course of the day to move at, you know the the uh, food trucks through the process? Uh, staffing will be um, variable depending on the number of inspections per day. Um, inspections per day are determined by the, when they expire. So um, the spring is typically a, a more heavy time, a heavier time than in this time of year. So you'll have less inspectors because we have less appointments. And in the springtime, we'll have more. We'll probably have a maximum. So we'll probably use all eight bays and, um, and probably use all eight time slots or seven time slots. And so from an operational a point of view, you are able to, based on the expiration dates, adjust your staffing levels to accommodate what you believe will be a, a busier time than others. That's correct. We forecast out at least a couple weeks in advance. And so are appointments made for this or or people just show up? No, they, we have an IVR system where they have to actually apply, for, renew their permits, and then call the system to get a scheduled appointment. So we have a calendar that runs at least two to three weeks in advance. Understood. Thank you very much. Yes, Commissioner Levin. Yeah, with the increased interest in mobile food facilities across the street, across the city, you know, the explosion of interest in food trucks and the availability of a variety of uh, businesses operating out of these mobile um, arrangements. What kind of planning work are you doing uh, for the future? Is this going to be, is this facility going to be adequate to, you know, if that demand continues and the um, use of food trucks across the city expands, uh, is this facility going to be good enough? Um, well, right now the f uh, permits are capped at, um, 5,100. Yeah, I realize so, that. So that's, um, that's what we'll, we'll focus is on, but this facility would be able to handle an increase if there were some, some increase. I mean, if you doubled it to 20,000, then no, obviously, but um, if there were some sort of um, percentage increase, facility, we should be able to handle that, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, part of, just to add, part of our planning in the facilities part, from the facilities point of view is to to forecast that and, and having the number of base here is, you know, as I said, is actually triple what you currently have. Okay, yeah. but good for now, but does have some room to grow? Yes, because currently we, we operate sometimes Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, sometimes Monday through Friday on the heavier day, heavier times of the year. So um, we have the capability with this facility to operate five days a week and to um, really plan our calendar out more effectively and productively. Okay, and presumably you could spread out the expiration dates on the yes. on the licenses so that you that's, could... That's something that we, we, have, we have control the, over looking yeah. to do. Okay. Other questions? Those are the only people who are signed up to speak. If there's anyone else present who would want to be heard on this item, now would be the time. Well, as someone who has been known um, to occasionally eat from a mobile food vendor, um, it gives me great comfort to meet the team behind um, the inspections. And the public hearing is closed. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar numbers 37 and 38, calendar number 37, CD12, C180186, ZMK, calendar number 38, N180187, ZRK, a public hearing in the matter of, an app of applications for a zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 3901 9th Avenue rezoning. We are going to have a 10-minute team presentation by Matthew Schomer, Stephen Wilder, and Jenny Kwong. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Matthew Schomer with Sheldon Lobel PC. Um, on behalf of the applicant, um, I'm here with Stephen Wilder, the project architect, and a representative from the applicant uh, from the uh, ownership group, Jenny Wang. Um, this is a zoning map and text amendment in the Sunset Park Borough Park border um, in Brooklyn, um, on the corner of 39th Street and 9th Avenue. Um, it's a zoning map amendment from an M12 district to an R7A C24 district to facilitate the development of this uh, proposed building that you see here, a uh, seven-story building with six stories of residential use 
and a commercial use on the ground floor, which is currently contemplated as a supermarket. Um, here we have the current zoning map. It's a little small, I apologize. In the upper left corner, you see the project site uh, bounded by 39th Street, 9th Avenue, and uh, New Utrecht Avenue. Here's a tax map showing the same. The project site uh, is in the upper left-hand corner, um, again on the corner of 39th and 9th, and the uh, the the uh, project area with the rezoning would also include uh, five other uh, tax uh, lots and portions of lots in this block. Uh, here are some photos of the current site as it as it exists now. Uh, it's improved with a uh, automobile sales and auto uh, maintenance facility, um, two two separate businesses. Um, each with just uh, one or two employees, um, and also a number of curb cuts. Um, you see the site on the corner here, uh, for a couple different views. Some more photos of the site um, in its current state, and then in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see a um, some of the other buildings that are included in the rezoning area. Uh, there's four buildings to the east of the site. Uh, you can see three of them here. Uh, essentially, these are all buildings, three-story buildings with commercial use on the ground floor, and then two stories of uh, non-conforming residential use. Obviously, this would become conforming residential use uh, were the uh, zoning map amendment to be approved. Uh, here's a, a blow-up of the, of the uh, zoning map amendment. You can see uh, here on the right the proposed R7A district uh, with the C24 commercial overlay. Uh, basically, the rest of the, 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 the block is currently split between an M12 and an R6 district with a C23 commercial overlay uh, along New Yetrick Avenue. Uh, this would make the entire block uh, residential, now split between R7A and R6. Uh, and again, the, the C24 commercial overlay as well. And since we're going from a manufacturing district to a residential district, uh, this, this application also includes a mandatory inclusionary housing um, tax amendment. Uh, the, the mandatory inclusionary housing area is shown here. Uh, we would be mapping both options one and two, and the applicant has, um, at this point, has chosen to use option one um, at, at this stage. A uh, tax map showing, showing the same thing. Uh, as before, just in a little bit more detail. And the, uh, the area map showing some of the other uses in the, in the area. Um, as you can see in the manufacturing district, there's in the M12 district along 39th Street, there's a number of um, larger manufacturing buildings with larger footprints um, to the south is uh, very residential in character. Uh, I think it's also good to note here on this map, if you look, uh, one block north of the project site, uh, you see the D subway line running there. Uh, there's actually a subway, uh, subway stop right at that intersection uh, for the D train. Also, if you take that D train one stop um, uptown, you can connect to, at 36th Street, to both the N and the R trains as well. So it's a very uh, transit accessible area, making this very appropriate for uh, transit oriented development. Uh, and finally here, we have the zoning comparison table, just showing the, uh, the basic characteristics of the new proposed R7A C24 district, um, including the uh, 4.6 FAR, which the applicant is proposing to, to develop a 4.6 FAR building, uh, as well as a 95 foot height limit. Um, and again, we are, we are within the transit zone. This proposed development with 40 units would uh, actually wave out of all parking requirements. Um, again, this is the building, 40 units of housing. Approximately 10 of these units would be um, affordable pursuant to MIH. Uh, no parking is provided. And then the ground floor would be used, uh, currently contemplated as a supermarket use, which the applicant has identified as a, as a need in this area um, for a supermarket with fresh produce. 
Um, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to the project architect, Stephen Wilder, to just walk you guys through the building a little bit. Hi, good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, and Commissioners. <clears throat> Thanks for having us this morning. So I'm going to discuss the design, sorry, the design of the exterior and the interior. Oh. <laughs> I've, I've never had that done before. <laughs> Pretty nifty, eh? <laughs> Technology, man. <laughs> so with the, um, with the conceptual rendering, we um, wanted to create some, ver some intrigue with the facade. Uh, it's a residential building, it's, uh, so it's um, something new in this, in this area. So we wanted to um, just sort of um, create, increase the quality of design in the area. So we have varying window sizes, varying materials to, to create interest on this corner lot. Um, the materials were still, you know, we're in conceptual phase, so we're still um, deciding on what materials and what uh, different sustainable strategies to apply to, to this building. Um, what you're looking at is the proposed uh, plot plan, which uh, just basically shows the outline of the building on the site, uh, as well as uh, some of the activity that's going on on, on the roof. And the, uh, so on the ground floor and in the proposed cellar plan, uh, we, we plan to have a commercial area <clears throat> really designed for a supermarket, <clears throat> which would, excuse me, which would occupy most of the cellar floor as well as the first floor. Uh, the re remaining space on the first floor would be for um, circulation for the residential portions of the building on the upper five floors. And then once we get into uh, upstairs in the building on the second floor, I was showing the second floor as well as the typical floor. Uh, each floor has eight units, a mix of one and two bedroom units. On the, on the second floor, we have created some outdoor space for um, some of the units in the uh, rear of the building. And the rest, we've uh, sort of created some real optimal views for uh, the rest of the apartments on the perimeter of the building on 39th Street as well as 9th Avenue. Uh, as well as, so on the typical floor plan, uh, is pretty much a similar layout as the second, uh, without the terraces, obviously, but um, the same, um, each apartment has uh, sufficient uh, window space um, and natural lighting and ventilation. And then on the roof plan, we've created a um, sort of a roof terrace, which um, has some we want to have some amenities for the building uh, conceptually, as well as some, we had a, enough space to have a recreation uh, indoor space on the roof. Um, so those are some of the things we provided. And then like I said before, th these are the elevations of, of the building. We just wanted to sort of um, just create some intrigue with the building in terms of uh, fenestration as well as some of the materials. And here's a, just a section of the building is showing uh, the floors. Uh, so five floors of residential and then the ground floor of commercial space with the uh, top floor for um, <clears throat> all of your roof uses with the elevator and stair bulkhead. So that's it. Great. So at this point, um, with nine seconds left, <laughs> Yep, just just questions now, yes. Great, questions from the commission. Commissioner Efron. Uh, I just had a question for Mr. Wilder. What is the facade treatment on uh, on the top of the floor plan? I think that's north, but I'm not certain. Okay. Um, there, I noticed it must be a lot line. There are no windows on that side, and I'm just wondering what the treatment is of that facade, since it will obviously be above whatever's there now. I'm trying to find a page real quick. Yeah, so above apartments seven and six on, on that wall, <coughs> what, what's the treatment of that facade? Above seven, this corner on, on that end? Yeah. 
It would be uh, definitely not a cementitious finish or anything like that. It will probably wrap around with the same material because it is visible. Um, most things, anything that's visible, we're going to make sure that uh, we pay special attention to it and make sure we have um, the same level of material as the that's front facade. great to hear. Thank you. Right answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Commissioner Tweck. Good morning. So I'm not sure if you had an opportunity to look at the uh, borough president's comments yet. We did, yes. Okay, great. So uh, his first comment was regarding a, a supermarket. So I, I, I do understand that you are um, going forward with an affordable supermarket at the site. Yeah, I mean that that's the plan. It's it's still a, you know very early stages, um, but the the plan from the beginning has been a, a supermarket that, at this location. We think that's a, a use that works both for the community and you know for the space. That large floor plate, you know, over two floors, um, works really well. Great. If you could speak to the borough president's other uh, suggestions, and um, specifically uh, among them the bedroom mix, and if you don't have the answers for now, if you can get back to us in writing. Yeah, sure. Uh, the bedroom mix. Um, you know, we've been we've been looking at um, the so the, the borough president um, typically, I think, in Brooklyn, um, always wants more two and three bedrooms. Family yeah, fit family size uh, units. Um, we're we're looking at how that works out. Um, we haven't really. So I say I can't. Have, I don't have an answer for you now. If, if there's a, a potential to increase the number of 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 two and three bedroom units. Um, we are looking at that, and we can we can try to get back to you with uh, with uh, whether that's something that's feasible for us. Thank you. And if you could address the other points mentioned, um, and if you don't have the answers now, again, you could do that in writing. Sure. And yeah. I, I didn't. I you know I didn't have them. Uh, I'll have to go through it. I have it right here. Um, I know it was issued late yesterday or yesterday. So yeah, yeah we just got it yesterday, but. So I think there's um, a comment about maximizing community participation in the MIH affordable housing. Actually, sorry, that's a. Um, yeah, so that's that's about um, you know utilizing nonprofits uh, pursuant to the MIH program to administer the affordable housing program. The applicant hasn't submitted hasn't selected an affordable housing um, you know partner yet, but they certainly plan on doing so. Um, as far as uh, extending the sidewalk, which was another comment from the borough president, um, relates somewhat to DOT, and, and I think maybe is a little a little early right now as far as because of the it's going to be as part of the builder's paving plan for a for, you know for a final new building. Um, again, we just saw this yesterday, but we can certainly consider right, right. Um, adopting up, that. Right, if you could re re respond in writing, it'd be uh, sure. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you. Yes, Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, good morning. I shut it off. Uh, good morning. Um, on the grocery store, do you have a tenant or expressed interest from a potential tenant in that category? Yeah, yeah, we don't have a we don't have a specific tenant in mind yet. No, mm -hmm. um, the applicant has felt that it's just been it's too early in the process, just because of the uncertainty of what you know yeah. happens with the application. Um, so you know, as soon as basically as soon as it's it's approved, hopefully, um, that's when those negotiations start. Okay. I mean, I think it, I think we should all be careful in terms of assuming uses um, and including them in an application when we're not sure about the market viability of a location. And I think, you know, 8,500 square feet um, is a bit of a stretch to call a supermarket. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it'd be helpful to sort of couch that in a little bit of understanding of what that category is and whether you do, in fact, have interest. Understood. So, thank you. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Delos. Just to follow up further on that, did, did you all, I, I'm not sure this site qualifies, but um, did you all consider this as a potential fresh site to take advantage of the fresh zoning that we have? There's so, the zoning and then there's a the tax. Yeah, benefit. so it's a fresh tax incentive area, not a fresh zoning okay. bonus area. So um, certainly if we qualify for the fresh tax incentive portion of it, we'll be applying for that as well. Okay, great. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Levin. I actually have two questions, a, a land use question and then a building design question. Um, the, the area to be rezoned, as you indicated, includes four other properties, and the um, EAS identified them as 
uh, or analyze them as two potential development sites um, that have that could create additional um, housing. And you included information about the status of the current tenants and indicated that your information was that they're not rent stabilized tenants. I noticed that the corner building has a banner on it, at least in the street view look at the building, indicating it's for sale. Does your client have any relationship uh, with those building owners or any understanding of what those owners' plans um, for redevelopment might be? Do you have any, you don't have any relationship with the other buildings on the block there? No. Those other? No, no, no relationship with those, um, those buildings at all. Okay, so um, the, the seeker analysis was just for the sake of seeker and not based on any yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, for sure. Information um, you had about what's Yeah, I mean, it's a significant M12, and with these three-story buildings, too, and R7A <laughs> is a significant upzoning yeah. that I think was appropriate to, to include those two as development sites. Sure. Yeah. Yes, I understand. But, but it wasn't based on any other, okay. uh, any other knowledge, yeah. Okay. Um, and then turning to building design, first of all, I just wanted to compliment Mr. Wilder on the, the thought you gave to explaining your, your de, you know, to, to developing your design in the... Um, way in which you've explained it to us, you did mention a desire to include um, sustainability features, um, if that becomes possible. And I realize that's beyond requiring those or beyond uh, what we're talking about here today. But I'm curious what you're thinking about in the, in the best yeah. scheme of things, what <laughs> would you like to be able to include in this building? Well, um, initially, the first thing we'll do is um, we'll think about passive design strategies uh, in terms of uh, just setbacks and how the sun, um, natural lighting, natural ventilation, um, heat gain, heat loss, certain things uh, in terms of the building envelope just to decrease the amount of uh, mechanical uses we have to uh, for the building. Um, and then other things uh, like uh, vertical shading, horizontal shading, just to, you know, just minimize the amount of power that the building has to use. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if <laughs> budget concerns, uh, all of those things come into play, but, you know, we'll investigate everything that's, that's possible during the design process. Okay. Are you thinking about any active design features? Uh, Yes, always, <laughs> as an architect. Yeah. But, you know, we'll, we'll put those things on the table when, when it comes about, and then we'll figure out what we can do. Good, good. I hope you, I hope you can keep pushing your client to make it as good as possible. <laughs> yes, definitely. Thank you. Other questions from the commission? Then thanks to the applicant team. There is no one else who's signed up to speak on this matter, but if anyone is present who would like to be heard, now would be the time. Okay, so this public hearing is closed. Thank you. Thank you. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar number, number 39, CD8, C160363, PQK, a public hearing in a matter of application for the acquisition of property concerning Friends of Crong Heights 16. We will have um, our first speaker in support is Allison Grant, and also from ACS available for questioning are Michael Bitar and Michael Blanchard. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Allison Grant, and I'm the Chief of Staff, the Division of Family, Child and Family Wellbeing at ACS. Um, good morning to Chair Lago and all the commissioners. It's nice to see you. Um, ACS is in favor of the continued use of the space at 963 Park Place as a daycare center. As you may know, the space was designed specifically to be a child care center, and therefore we would advocate for it to continue as such. Uh, I'm going to quickly just go through this PowerPoint, say some quick facts, and then take any questions. So um, this is the location uh, on Park Place in the Crown Heights neighborhood. Um, this is the exterior. You can see it's kind of um, just a small storefront uh, with a nice banner, which I think is helpful um, for passerby. And you can see the nice trees, et cetera. Uh, classroom, this is what it's all about for us at ACS. The kids um, are able to have a really bright, colorful room, lots of um, light coming in, and lots of space. Uh, this is the library, and a great resource for children and their families. Uh, Multi-purpose room, which can be used if there's inclement weather outside. 
and I'll just put it back in the classroom for a while. I just quickly go through this. Um, the current contractor at this site that's contracted with the ACS to provide services is Friends of Crown Heights. Um, the name of the program is the Park Place Daycare Center. Um, they're permitted by the Department of Health to serve 96 children that are preschoolers, and we uh, budget with them to serve 80. I believe there's some other uses um, for kids for private dollars um, that use the rest of the space. It's a child care program, so the families that use this program have a reason for care, meaning that the families are impoverished um, and they have a reason which would be working in school, a training program, or they're homeless or looking for work for up to six months. Um, they're currently at 75% enrollment, which is reflective of the late August date um, and our trends every year. Um, with that, I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Grant. Questions? Commissioner you Cheryl. Are... <laughs> <laughs> it's confusing with two last names. I apologize. Yeah. Um, I have two questions for you. One, I'm not sure, I'm sure you are uh, queued up to explain or have somebody who else who can explain mm -hmm. um, about the roof situation yes. and how long it's been out of commission and just typically how that's handled, um, where the kids play when it is out of commission, um, particularly in a, a leaseholdover situation. And my second question is just because you've shown us color photos. Um, are the children wearing uniforms and is this typical of the daycare situation? Um, every center has their own rules about that. This contractor, Friends of Crown Heights, it's something they like to do to try to normalize, you know, um, have everyone kind of on equal footing. But no, it's something that each program can do on their own. So it is a good point. Um, in terms of the roof, um, I'll speak quickly to the policy and then I'll defer to my colleague Michael to speak about um, the actual work and, but in terms of the policy, um, as I think we've discussed here previously, you know, the city's health code requires some kind of, you know, play, motor skill development. So if there's a space like a roof that's not currently able to be used, we make sure it's closed and not able to be accessed. And they will either play, I believe there's a small play yard, uh, which Michael can clarify, um, or really they'll use that multi-purpose space, which I showed, um, if it's inclement weather, or they'll go on a neighborhood walk, which is always good for learning. You know, there's the truck, there's the car, there's the fire department, et cetera. Um, or they'll go to a neighborhood playground that has age appropriate um, place um, materials, equipment. Uh, Michael, do you wanna speak about how long it's been out of commission? The, uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Michael Batar for the record. Uh, Good, good morning. Uh, it's been out for a while because the roof is uh, is leaking, uh, or was leaking, and so the scope of work, as as the city planner mentioned, includes major repairs to the roof. So until we do that, um, uh, the neighborhood uh, has a large park not far from there. So the center has been operating without the roof for a while, and they will continue until the renovations are completed. Um, they do use, there is a rear yard, which gives them some relief, and there is a, the basement also has uh, room for them to play. But the uh, center is fully operational, regardless of the roof. Um, That's right. And, and things are under control in terms of leaks. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Vice questions? Chair Knuckles. Uh, Ms. Grant, I don't know if you or, or, or Michael were here on Monday <clears throat> when there was some Michael was, and I got a full report out as okay. well. Okay. Um, could that. you go to the uh, photo of the entrance? Yes. Yeah. And uh, I think it was said that yes. that uh, entrance was going to be reimagined. Mm -hmm. Well, my understanding is the scope of work, um, Vice Chair, that the scope of work will involve the windows, at all, all of the windows uh, being replaced, which will require the removal of the bars. Mm -hmm. And at that time, they'll be looking at what kind of glass and windows they, they could put up with the hope to remove things like that. Um, as you know, we're collaborating with other city agencies around design, uh, and that would be part of that effort. I look forward to it. Thank you. As do we. Mm. Other questions? Okay, thank you to the applicants. Thank you um, very much. There are no other speakers signed up for this hearing, but if anyone wants to be heard, now would be the time to come forward. And so the public hearing is closed. <laughs> Calendar number 40, CD2, N190101, HKK. A public hearing in a matter of a communication concerning a landmark designation of the Borum Hill Historic District Extension. I'll note that Commissioner Delos is recused from this item, and I'll welcome our first speaker in support, Ann Friedman. Uh, 
Uh, good morning, Chair Lago and commissioners. Um, I'm Ann Friedman, a resident and homeowner of the Borm Hill Historic District for the past 29 years and co-chair of the Borm Hill Association's Historic District Extension Committee. The Borum Hill Association, representing neighborhood residents, has advocated for the expansion of the historic district for many years. We've worked closely with LPC staff and City Council Member Levin for the last two years. Really excited to be here today. The expanded district includes portions of two blocks of Atlantic Avenue in the Atlantic Avenue Special Zoning District established in 1972, at the same time as the original historic district. These 54 buildings represent an extraordinarily intact and cohesive mixed-use corridor of red brick row houses with commercial ground floors and residences above. Originally occupied by butchers, bakers, and furniture makers, these buildings supported and enhanced the life of our community in the 19th century, just as the salons, restaurants, boutiques, and delis of this portion of Atlantic Avenue support and enhance the life of Borum Hill and our many visitors today. In 1972, there was a clear distinction between Atlantic Avenue west of Court Street, included in the city's very first historic district, Brooklyn Heights, in 1965, and in the Cobble Hill Historic District in 1969, versus the east end of Atlantic between Court and Flatbush. In the early 70s, the Borm Hill section of Atlantic Avenue was considered blighted with vacant and deteriorated buildings. The establishment of the Special Zoning District preserved the character of the historic buildings and storefronts east of Court while maintaining their economic viability. Today, that economic distinction west and east is gone, and the Borm Hill section of Atlantic Avenue is just as vital and viable as the Brooklyn Heights and Cobble Hill blocks, with greater public transportation access. For 50 years, LPC has done a fantastic job regulating and preserving the special character of Atlantic Avenue within the Brooklyn Heights and Cobble Hill historic districts, and LPC will do the same for the portion of Atlantic Avenue included in the expanded Warm Hill Historic District. Brooklyn Heights institutions, like Sahadis, have thrived and doubled in size under LPC regulation, while Brooklyn outposts of national chains like Urban Outfitters and Trader Joe's have flourished on the Cobble Hill side under LPC oversight, along with small businesses of all kinds in both districts. That's because LPC has administered these districts fairly and wisely, offering preservation protection while being receptive to proposals for alterations, additions, and good new design in historic contexts. We're confident that LPC will continue to do so in the expanded Borm Hill Historic District, while LPC's storefront rules will reinforce the goals of the special zoning district, preserving the special vitality and character of this portion of Atlantic Avenue. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Questions from the commission? Thank you. Our next speaker in opposition is Douglas Shane, who will be followed by Glenda Ford. Honorable Chairperson and, and Commissioners, good morning. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. As a small property owner for the past 25 years, cons um, concerns about changes to the building are already restricted as Atlantic Avenue is already a part of a special downtown district. So if the concern is development, it cannot occur in any event or be extremely limited. Inclusion of my building as well as the others on Atlantic Avenue appear to be arbitrary in what is now watered down version of what the original plan was. If the intention would include the premises on Atlantic Avenue, towards 4th Avenue to our south or Columbia Avenue to the north. My suggestion include them all, and in, any exceptions to that have a rational basis. They have not included properties in this plan that are similar to what has been included. With respect to this process, we have not been, all of us have not been fully apprised of all developments and, and been fully involved in this process. I urge this board to direct the committee with this, with this proposal to give further consideration and the process that they've used to be more transparent. Thank you for your consideration. Another speaker will have a little more in depth of what we're looking at here. I just happen to have been called first on this. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Shane? Yes, <laughs> hang around for a while. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, good morning. Um, uh, what are your plans for this property and how might this um, uh, affect you? Right now, we have no plans. We have, we've, I've, I've personally been there since the mid-80s. We have no development. We have a small building that has one commercial on the bottom and two residential units. Certainly no plans, but 
No one knows what the future is. But in any event, we're restricted to, my understanding is we're restricted to, to including anything above four floors. So we really couldn't develop the property at all. Under the current. Under the current, under the current way. So there really isn't any intention. What has happened on Atlantic Avenue is there have been major developments. And it appears to be that those who haven't developed are now being included in this process, where the others have not been included. And maybe they, they're a little late in getting this done. But we certainly, we have no plans. We have no plans on, on the horizon. And we like to keep it the way it is. But under this restriction that we'd have, we certainly would have more restrictions than we have already. And we, and we do have a number of them. So we don't have any intention of, of, of doing that. And my, and my understanding, we're talking to others who are opposed to, and there's certainly a number of us who are, are in the same, are in the same situation, that if they wanted to change a, a uh, something in the storefront or something, if they had a tenant, they would have to go through a, a lot of red tape. And by the time that gets, gets done, they may lose that tenant. So that, that's part of what the process is. None of us have done any changes, and the ones that have are not included in this process. And, and they'll show you the map. The, we have another person who will show you what, what they've taken pictures of. Can I follow up on that? Sure. Um, you know, you mentioned some concerns about losing tenants because of the long process it sometimes requires. Um, where does that come from? You have examples um, of historic districts where that's occurred, or is that just a sense? No, it's more of a sense. I, I don't have the specifics on that, but I do know in talking and in, in meeting with the people who were on that committee that they told us what we would have to go through and what the process would be. And it's certainly when you turn, if you did have a situation like that, if there were added costs, some of the people who do try to rent have limited bases also. Mm -hmm. And for them to have extent, extensive additional costs, it either have to be absorbed by the owners. And there are a number of empty per, uh, spaces over there. So, with, you know, we'd like to think of it in the grand scheme of things, that, are, that development and that thing is prosperous, but they do come and go. Thank you. You're Vice Chair Knuckles? Yes, sir. I'm just curious. Did you testify at the uh, May 8th public hearing conducted by Landmarks Preservation? No, I was not at that meeting. Did you know about it? I only learned about it within maybe a day or two before, and I, and I had a, a commitment. I couldn't be there. I, I realized the, the importance of being there, and I certainly would. I, I've, when I was apprised of any of the meetings that they had recently, I've been there and I've voiced my I voice my concerns, and I've been where I can be at. And I, I understand the importance of it, and that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Levin. Uh, yes, just for the record, could you identify which property is yours? 370 Atlantic Avenue. Thank you. More questions? Thank you, Mr. Shane. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker in opposition is Glenda Ford, who, who will be followed by Melissa Ennin. Well, Melissa has encompassed most of the things that I wanted to discuss, so I don't want to be repetitive. And I had submitted my written objections prior to this. So, so I would leave the floor to Melissa. Thank you. And so with that, we will turn to Melissa Ennin, who will be followed by Romeo Jove. Hi, I'm Melissa. And then I own the building at 388 Atlantic Avenue. It's a commercial building, three stories, all commercial, no residential. I noticed that everybody else just came up here and all their stuff magically appeared up there. I have a flash drive. Is it too complicated to show you? Because I, I could just give you the flash drive and tell you what's on it. I think that might be more efficient. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> but then if you would give it to the secretary, she could then make copies for the commissioners. OK, thank you. Um, I've owned that building for 24 years, and I've lived in the neighborhood for 28. Um, and I'm here representing 16 of the property owners on Atlantic Avenue who are affected by this extent, uh, proposed extension. Um, those 16 
owners own 20 buildings. There are 54 buildings affected by this. So uh, that's 37% of the buildings in this proposal I have signed this petition. I don't know if you got a copy of it, but if you didn't, I'm gonna give it to you. Uh, the petition that was presented to the Landmarks Commission uh, of owners on Atlantic Avenue who are not opposed to the entire uh, proposal uh, of the 288 buildings, but only the 54 buildings on Atlantic Avenue. Um, Doug already mentioned that our buildings are part already of the special downtown district and our heights are capped. Uh, so that is something that the residents don't have to worry about. Um, <clears throat> He mentioned the arbitrariness of which buildings went in and out, and that's probably our biggest, cons well, that's a very large concern of ours. The original proposal extended, and I'm, I have, um, actually have printouts of the maps, and I, since I have limited time, I'm not gonna go through that in detail, but I'm gonna give each one of you this 11 by 17 printout. Give it to me. Give it to the secretary, she'll yes. give it to the commissioners. That will show you what was originally in the proposal and what those buildings looked like as compared to the buildings that somehow in the end ended up in the, in the, in the, the final proposal. Um, we have asked repeatedly both from LPC and from the bid and from other people involved, the other proponents to give us an explanation of why some buildings and strips were included and some others were not, and we have never received a clear answer. It seems almost intentionally obfuscatory because uh, we're not idiots and we've never really understood why. For example, my block, I live on the north side. There are five buildings, including mine, that in the proposal you'll see on those pages from 392 to three, oh, can I finish? I'm afraid we stick to us. Oh, a then let me just say that, that those, there's 145 Actually, we will we'll now turn to questions from the commission, and I think you'll receive some questions. Okay. <laughs> yes, Commissioner uh, Marin. Ma'am, do you have some further thoughts you'd like to share with us, please? <laughs> Uh, there's a hundred, for example, if you look at the map, on the south side of Atlantic Avenue, only the middle part of the block is included. We were told that the two ends of the block, which have, you know, eight buildings there and four buildings there, were excluded because they have no historic value. Well, there are five buildings in the middle of my block, including mine, that in the proposal they say are non-contributory, two of which were built in the last 10 years. Um, they're definitely not historic value, they were just built. And why were they included and the ones across the street not? Why was the wonderful Exlax building and all the beautiful churches across the street not included when they have clear historic value and some of the residential and mixed use buildings have, they were excluded. So we've been trying to figure out why. But fi you can see in our pictures the, fin the, the rest of that issue. Um, but finally, there's this issue of the intent. Um, we share um, the, the intent of keeping continuity in the neighborhood, and most of us, I mean, it's single owners who own these buildings. Many of us have businesses in our buildings, and we love the neighborhood, and we want the continuity. We love the sense of community in the neighborhood, and, you know, we don't have any intentions of, you know, obliterating our buildings, but um, we feel like, in fact, many of the people who do not have the own, I own, I own the businesses in my building, but some of the owners who rent out the, the ground floor uh, really are very concerned about this issue of tenants, mom and pop shops not being willing to sign these leases. I mean, if I were a mom and pop shop, I wouldn't sign a lease in a historic landmark building because I couldn't, it, the expense would, uh, for the build out would be so much greater than it would be in a non-landmark building. And you could just go on to the next block. You could go, there's, given the fact that it's only our block, you could go to the next block. Why rent down there? So I think it puts us at an arbitrary disadvantage. Why us? And, and Ms. Go ahead. Yes, Commissioner Marin. I have, I just have a further question. I mean, you're, you're mentioning <clears throat> um, affecting leases uh, uh, for the commercial tenants and, and extra expense on the commercial tenants. The, 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 the tenants themselves, 
the interior of the building is not being landmarked. It's the exterior of the building. So the interior really doesn't get affected by this action. However, the, the, the impetus for landmarking then puts the onus on the owner to comply with <clears throat> keeping their building up to landmark status. So I'm not too sure what the correlation is between the tenant renting and the opposition to the landmarking of this neighborhood, of this section of the neighborhood. I think that the storefronts, I mean, pe when we, when the landmark people came over and had uh, hearings and discussions, uh, for example, they came to my building and I asked them, well, how would I be limited? And they said, I said, I wanted to be, you know, my windows are like 25 years old, single pane, we freeze in the winter. And they said, this is what you'd have to do to replace the windows. I thought, oh my God, you know, I'll just go get that film at Home Depot and we'll tape it up. And I, I'm not going to, I can't afford to hire all those people to replace my windows. The other thing is we're a community center based on uh, linking sustainability with worker co-ops and we have um, uh, a whole, we had a whole plan to, to put panels on a pergola on the roof because we already harvest 10, uh, 50 gallon barrels of rainwater. We're waiting for the city to legalize using rainwater to flush toilets. And we had this whole idea about what we're gonna do with the roof. And she made it very clear that that would not be an option because it would be visible from the street. So I'm, I'm just very disappointed because uh, these are things that would have contributed to community in the neighborhood and um, it's very sad. Commissioner Ortiz. Thank you. Um, I would like to note that on Monday's pre-hearing, uh, this issue came up, you know, and um, we heard quite a bit about why, particularly along Atlantic Avenue, um, why some buildings were part of this designation and this application and others were not. And I believe that's available on online, uh, video uh, is available online. So I would suggest um, looking at, at that. Um, Was that pre-hearing open? Yes, yes they always are, and they're also simulcast. We never heard about online. that. Yeah, so so I think that would be useful because it went a long way towards explaining um, the rationale uh, for for why uh, you know, Atlantic was carved out as it was. Um, you know, you you mentioned that, um, if you could just speak to the, the data, you, you said 37% of the buildings in the proposal um, are uh, owned by the property owners that you're here representing, is Correct. that? Correct. Okay. Um, is it required to tell the owners about this pre-hearing? All of our meetings oh. are publicly noticed. We were not notified. No, again, it's up on our website that um, on the Monday before a public hearing, the commission engages in a review session. But again, um, your role now, ma'am, is to answer questions from the commission. I and I, I think there may be others. Yes, Commissioner Levin. Yeah, I, I don't have so much a question, but an observation. The, um, the, the meeting on Monday was when it's, it's a, a, a meeting that the commission holds to prepare ourselves for the hearings such as these. Um, and uh, <clears throat> Department of City Planning staff um, remind us of what the applications are about. And in the case of this application, staff from the Landmarks Preservation Commission um, came and explained to us the process that they had been through in um, approving the land, the extension um, and per spoke particularly of the analysis that the Landmarks Commission had given to this Atlantic Avenue um, issue. Um, but I think it's also important to point out that our responsibility here is not to revisit the judgment of the Landmarks Commission about Landmarks matters, um, but simply to provide a report to the City Council about whether the Landmarks <clears throat> Preservation Commission's actions is in conflict with uh, land use uh, rules that are on the books or other plans that we know about that the city has for work in, that, in this area. So this is not an appeal. This process today is not an appeal of the Landmarks decision, but um, simply our hearing about whether what kind of a report we're going to give to the city council about the land use aspects of this. We don't have any jurisdiction over the historic preservation issues here. 
Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner Levin. Um, and I would note that the City Council generally holds a hearing before its land use committee on matters that come from the Commission to the Council. And so uh, you may wish to follow the public notices of City Council hearings. Other questions? Thank you, Ms. Ennen. Thank you. <laughs> Another speaker, um, our next speaker is Romeo Jove. I assume you're going to check if he's out in the ante room. Okay. In the meantime, I'll note that uh, Mr. Jove is the only other speaker who has signed up to speak on this matter. Um, but if anyone else would like to be heard, we could come forward. Okay. Jim's saying he's not here. Yeah. Okay. And with that, the public hearing is closed. Okay, Borough of Queens, calendar numbers 41 and 42, calendar number 41, CD1, C180085, ZMQ, calendar number 42, N180086, ZRQ. Public hearing in the matter of application for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning the Variety Boys and Girls Club rezoning. <coughs> We are going to have a 10-minute team presentation by Richard Bass, Matthew Troy, and Walter Sanchez. Judges, no. Madam Chair, uh, Vice uh, Chair Knuckles, Commissioners, good morning. I'm Richard Bass. I'm with the law firm Ackerman LLP. I'm very happy to be presenting this application for the uh, expansion of the Variety Boys and Girls Club of Queens. The project site is located on the northeast corner of 21st Street and 30th Road. Uh, before I go into the, uh, the actions, I want to just walk you around the neighborhood a little bit. This is the existing condition of the, of the club. Not to be overly critical, but it's not very pedestrian friendly. <clears throat> As you can see on 21st Street, this is the primary uh, entrance and aspect of the neighborhood. The actions that we're proposing is a rezoning from R7A C23 and R6B to R7X C23. Uh, the text amendment would also map uh, this area as a mandatory inclusionary area. In consultation with the council member, uh, we chose option two. Um, I understand uh, the council member uh, at the council will uh, oppose it to be, uh, propose it to be uh, mapped as option one and two. Here's the site, uh, it's in Astoria. Uh, this is the proposed zoning. Uh, the, the frontage on, on, uh, on 21st Street would be, continue to be a commercial overlay. On the left is the existing zoning, on the right is the proposed zoning. The proposed zoning will allow for the development of a 14-story residential building with a, uh, approximately 112 dwelling units, 34 which will be affordable. There will be 7,700 square feet of retail and a almost 80,000 80, square feet uh, boys and girls club. This is what it looks like in model. Um, as you can see to the south, there's an existing senior building. Um, our design is to have the base of our proposed residential building on 21st Street to match the height of the existing building. And as the, the building gets taller, it will step back and we'll have more glazing so it, the building will feel lighter. This is a footprint of the building. On, on 30th Road will be the entrance of the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, in effect, the height of the development will step down from 21st Street uh, to five stories at the Boys and Girls Club, and then we'll meet the R6B uh, built condition. This is what the plan looks in elevation on the left is the proposed Boys and Girls Club. On the right is the proposed building. As you can see from the, the graphics, the, the top four floors will be glazed. This is what the elevation looks like from 21st Street. I will now turn it over to Matt Troy, who is the executive director who can walk you through the existing and proposed program. Thank you. Uh, good morning, members of the commission. I'm grateful to have this opportunity to address you. 
my name is Matthew Troy. I'm the executive director of the Variety Boys and Girls Club. Um, I believe this project is going to transform our neighborhood and serve as a resource for all families for generations to come. Uh, we are designing this Boys and Girls Club to be the center for high quality programming uh, for our kids. Um, today, uh, we serve 1,700 families uh, who rely on our organization. As you can see from this map, um, we serve everyone. Families from all walks of life come together in our club. Um, we also strive to keep our programs free and low cost. Um, this past year, we were able to reduce the fee for after school to free for most of our families. Um, overall, 85% of after school programs are free. We, we run multiple sites and 60% for summer camp uh, is free. So we keep trying to lower the fees whenever possible. Um, what I believe sets our organization apart um, is our unique quality programs and our partners that help take it to the next level. Um, today our club features a technology makerspace that connects local professionals in the tech industry to collaborate with our kids. We offer a digital 3D architecture class in partnership with Skanska, the same engineers rebuilding LaGuardia Airport. Um, JetBlue has awarded our club with a grant to build science hubs at our locations. Uh, we have a NASA funded robotics program in our science exploration lab. Our kids get to work with real life uh, scientists on uh, experiments. Um, and in our teaching kitchen, our kids learn gourmet cooking and healthy eating. Um, and on Fridays, they're offered two free bags of fresh produce to bring home for their families. Um, our media production program has been very popular this past year. Um, our kids produced enough films to start their own film festival. We called it the Variety International Film Festival. We had filmmakers come from uh, around the country, 30 of them, to work with our kids on it. It's really exciting. Um, our club's very busy on the weekends with our swim classes, taekwondo, ballet. Um, uh, we believe that to survive and thrive in the 21st century economy, our children need the experiences that only our Boys and Girls Club can provide. And there really aren't that many other options in our area. Um, some of you may be thinking that sounds great, sign me up. Um, but unfortunately, our current space um, uh, has space limitations. Uh, in the past year, we had 642 children um, on our wait list across each of our core programs. We were not able to serve them because of this. Um, that's where the new Boys and Girls Club comes in um, that we are proposing. It will nearly double capacity and meet the needs for families for generations to come. Um, there'll be more purpose-built activity rooms like our maker space, our science exploration lab, um, a larger pool, gymnasium, and community room. Uh, uh, space for an early education program, as well as a teen college and career center. Expanded office space. Uh, we now have over 100 staff uh, on our payroll and growing. And a modern, uh, energy efficient mechanical plant designed for 21st century safety and accessibility standards. To sum up, uh, we are a community center. We bring together the best of Queens to give our children the opportunity to reach their full potential in life. We need this project to continue with our mission. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Walter Sanchez. I'm the volunteer president of our board. And there are 12 members of, of our board. And, and the reason we are, are doing this expansion, as Matt explained, is because we've really run out of room. And there are ways. In 1955, they built these clubs like this. We bought, we, uh, we bought a half a square block in Long Island City in Astoria right there. And um, the way that to, to get gangs off the street and into a, a safe place. And it, it's, it's changed uh, significantly, where they used to teach metal shop and, and plumbing and things like that. Now we're looking looking at technology and entrepreneurism as, a, as, a, as a, a core. We still serve those underserved areas, and um, we saw that we had um, room to expand, and, uh, and we had FAR to expand. We own a, um, a senior residence on the property as well that's 100 units, and it's 100% affordable. So we, we believe in that, um, and a lot of people from Astoria, seniors, live in that home. It's on the property in the corners. There's a picture before you saw. But we, we feel we have been, we, we realize that we had to meet with the stakeholders in about 
five years ago, we met with stakeholders from the area to talk to them about what a Boys and Girls Club should look like 50 years from now. And it involved education, it involved the planetarium, it involved bio labs and, and things like that, and a bigger basketball court. We have a pool now, we're gonna have a bigger pool. Uh, these are the things that are real, really a home base for the community. So we need to expand that. Um, we need to serve more than 200 children a day, and, and the only way to do that is to expand our footprint. So 100,000 square foot facility, although it might sound a bit much. Uh, we know we, we know we're going to need that. We're going to need the education space inside the building. Uh, we've done things with Vaughan College, with JetBlue, um, uh, and what's incredible about that is they they brought in their um, people to help teach our, our kids, and if you saw the excitement on the kid's face when an engineer comes in or an astrophysicist from Columbia University, it had the board think, wow, we, we can really partner with these people and expand the minds of these children when they walk into our facility. So that's why we want to expand, and we really plan to do some kind of a venture partnership with a developer. We haven't selected one yet. We went through this change on our own because we wanted to control it. We didn't want developers to say to us, well, you got to do it this way um, for us. So that's what we come here for. And I still have 41 seconds, but I'll leave it to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to, uh, I'm sorry. Commissioners, uh, I've been before you a lot uh, in, in the last couple of years. This is an excellent application. I'm very pleased to be able to represent them and, and take th this 53-year-old uh, uh, facility into the next you know, 100 years. Questions? Well, I want to start by thanking both Mr. Troy and Mr. Sanchez for your service on behalf of our city's youth. I also, I also have a question. Why is it called variety? <laughs> Good question. Yeah. It's another 10 minutes going here. <laughs> um, they, uh, the, the, the president of the club back in the 50s was the president of United Artists. And United Artists, his name is Salah Hassanine. United Artists back then owned theaters. That's what they did. In, in the 19, in 1920-22, in Astoria, there was a child left at one of the theaters, and the industry association adopted that child and called her Variety. Hence, the magazine was named after Variety Magazine, was named after that incredible story, you know, great story. So they adopted this child, and one of the uh, theater owners took them in, and I don't know, they just kept the name, and that's why they used the name. Now you know. Fascinating tale of our city. <laughs> Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you. Uh, Actually, Mr. Sanchez, you anticipated my question uh, because I was going to ask whether or not the Boys Club would own the entire building, including the residential or just the community facility portion. Uh, we're not. We're, we're not sure. We pl we plan to. I don't. I think the optics of the community doesn't look good if we sell it. You know, maybe a hundred year ground lease, maybe a ground lease or something like that. But we. I, I don't. I don't think it looks good to sell part of the property. You know, it's just, I mean, uh, the, it would have, we'd have to be real hard pressed. And, the, and the, the values when we've spoken to finance people say what they'll offer you for buying it as opposed to ground leasing it isn't a lot more. So I'd, probably not. Other questions? Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, good, good morning. Um, I'm interested in, in what's gonna happen at the ground floor. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, 7,700 square feet of retail that would consist of a bakery, a pizzeria, an internet cafe, a grocery store, and a credit union. <laughs> Very ambitious um, for that space. Do you have tenants uh, lined up? Have you explored, you know, how you actually program that much activity in that kind of space? Um, could you speak to that? Um, yes, we do not have tenants uh, lined up yet because this is a very long process and they'll line up a pizzeria uh, three years into a ULERP and two years into construction uh, doesn't make any sense. I think the goal as articulated in the application is they want to uh, 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 retain community type uh, retail. Uh, that either could be training for the kids or uh, uh, employment for the kids, but something that would speak to the neighborhood. Also, as you saw from the, the pictures, that uh, street front is not very pedestrian friendly. So by having uh, local retail uh, on the ground floor will we'll make that pedestrian friendly. 
I mean, we certainly welcome that. I think this is now the second application that sort of asserted a set of uses as if they were assumed. Um, I think we should just be a little more careful with how we describe um, the kinds of uses we anticipate, particularly when we don't know if there's market demand, they, there are no tenants. You know, if it's simply just saying neighborhood uses are anticipated, I think that would be a little more accurate in the future. Well, sometimes we, we have to pick uses because we have to identify the impacts because certain uses will have different trip generation. So it, it, I hear what you're saying and I'll be more careful on our next applications, but a lot of times we're, we're asked to pick uses so that our environmental consultant can study what those uh, impacts might be. Certainly, but neighborhood-oriented convenience uses will allow you to do that without identifying this. I mean, I find that, you know, the description of all of these uses and the suggestion you're going to get them in 7,700 square feet just, you know, doesn't doesn't pass the sniff test. Um, and, and so I just want us to be careful with what we assert in our applications when we're you know. I, I appreciate that. We're not going to get all those uses in 7,700 square feet. But that's not how it's written. It's written right. as if you're going to get them. Um, my next application will be more careful. Thank you. I would also note that on a rezoning in the same way that the illustrations that we see are illustrative, um, the exact same um, grain of salt with respect to the uses. Um, with the rezoning comes certain use groups, and that is the envelope that we as a commission have to consider. Yes. <laughs> But not the categories, use groups in terms of neighborhood serving, not necessarily the categories themselves. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I, I think we as a commission understand, and I thank you for clarifying it for applicants as well. Commissioner Delos. Hi, how are you? Um, first, I just want to say this this seems like a, a great project. Um, and I wanted to just go a little bit deeper, especially since you all um, may be entering into a ground lease type arrangement uh, with, with the developer of the residential building. Um, it's specifically just to talk about the MIH option piece of it. Um, and whether or not, given all that you, you're likely to m maintain um, overall kind of mm -hmm. control, whether or not you see a need um, to have the new development have a bedroom mix or affordability levels that more align with your mission um, in terms of who you might serve in the future. Well, in the application, uh, our design for both the affordable and the, the market rate, more than half of the units were two and three bedroom, which would serve this community. Uh, that's our goal. As we enter in, into deeper discussions with the developers, uh, that will continue to be our goal. Um, but we're, we're mindful of what the community you know, needs are, and that's reflected in our application. And how about on the MIH piece and the community board's recommendation with that with the, option one? The, uh, it, it was option one with a deeper subsidy, and we're open to exploring that, it, but... What I have here is it was option one with a 30% instead of a 25% right. overall. Right, so that's, that's a deeper subsidy, so they're asking for more units. Uh, we'll explore that, but the reality is that there's a finite pie, and we're dividing that pie up into the residential that will support the Boys and Girls Club. If there is wiggle room to go to 30 um, percent uh, of the units, we will. But right now, we, I can only promise that we'll explore that. Yes, Commissioner Efron. Thank you. Since you mentioned the senior housing that you operate, I, I just wonder if you can share with us whether that was um, a project you acquired or is it similar to this in that you had the land and you had a developer build just so we can get a sense of, of uh, a little bit of experience sure. if it's relevant. It's, it, we, owned, we owned it. We built it back in 2003. It, it precedes my tenure on the board, but in 2003 it was, it was built. And you operate it, or you have a nonprofit that operates. We have an, We have a, I mean, you an are a nonprofit. We have a part, have the developers are partner, and mm -hmm. they they used um, tax credits, and they you know we have an, an operator, somebody who operates it, but we own it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful, <clears throat> Commissioner Levin. Well, and perhaps in a similar vein, Mr. Sanchez, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about the planning you've done for how you finance this whole project. Are you looking at the um, residential portion of it to um, 
cross-subsidize the development of the community facility, or do you have a financing plan for the yeah, community facility? It's a big part How's of it. How's it all going to work? These, these are expensive things to build. Yeah, um, a big part of it is we, we think that the residential will finance, will help finance the um, our mission at the club. and. Um, Certain grants and uh, from from uh, uh, for-profit companies, led to some legislative uh, grants from local councilmen, borough president, uh, have been you know we've we've discussed them. But a, a large part, a large portion, a portion of it, through the ground lease of this property or the joint venture of of this property. No. And we okay. just haven't you know we've had a lot of interest from developers, and we're just not stuck on any one way of doing this thing. I don't, I don't think that's really fair. Actually, developers come to us with, with whole different like perspectives on it. It's kind of cool. <laughs> you know, you don't, you know, where they're coming, so you don't say no to anything. You know, one, one, one came to us with Empire State Development money that is that they know is there and that, you know, they feel Queens hasn't gotten. I think Staten Island got something. We, we haven't gotten anything in three years, so there's money out there for, for, for job creation. So. Yeah. Like, all right, let's yeah. that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. But, but you're also looking at other um, grants and opportunities to support the community facility portion? Yeah. Do you, th do you think this is going to work? I know it's going to work. Okay, good. Yeah, we know it's going to work. We, we haven't spent the last three years of our lives you know, <laughs> thinking it's not going to work. <laughs> we like the optimism. <laughs> other questions? Well, thank you to the applicant team. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Our next speaker in support is Rochelle Domond. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about this project. Um, so my name is Rachel Damon or Rochelle, it's fine how you pronounced it. <laughs> um, I'm currently employed at the Boys and Girls Club as the dance specialist, performing arts specialist. Um, I've been employed there since 2013, since um, I was in high school. But even before that, I was a club kid. I went there in middle school. Um, I, I went to a new school at the time. I was new to the neighborhood, didn't know anything. A friend of mine told me about the Boys and Girls Club and you know she invited me to come see everything that was there and nothing really interests me except the performing arts. Like I've always loved to dance. It's what I've been doing since I was eight, trained professionally, unprofessionally. Um, you know, it became my passion, it was my escape, but you know, me, I was always like a chubby child. So people used to discourage me or tell me that I shouldn't pursue dance or I shouldn't, I don't have the body type, but um, going to the Boys and Girls Club, all of that changed. All of that changed. The peers, the staff, they supported me, they encouraged me. Um, the board wrote me a $5,000 check for college to study dance education um, when I was a senior. Um, the performing arts program has opened so many doors for me and I hope to do the same for the generations next to come. So this expansion would really help me with that. We could use mirrors in our dance studio, we could use central air in our dance studio, we could use ballet bars in our dance studio, we could use all of that. So I just hope that this, you guys, are encouraged to help. <laughs> and you guys can see the importance in our mission here, generation after generation after generation. I went from taking classes at the Boys and Girls Club to teaching, and that's what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you for such powerful personal testimony. Vice Chair Knuckles. No, I, just an observation. You have an extraordinary amount of poise for someone who was just in high school five years ago. That's yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Other observations? Okay. If not, well, thank you. Okay, that, those are the only folks who have signed up to speak on this public hearing, but as usual, if there's anyone else present, now would be the time. So this public hearing is closed. Borough of Queens, calendar numbers 43 and 44. Calendar number 43, CD1, C180211, ZMQ. Calendar number 44, N180212, ZRQ. A public hearing in a matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 111-14 35th Avenue rezoning. Good afternoon. Our Chair first Lo speaker will be Jacqueline <laughs> Scarinci. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair Lago, Vice Chair Knuckles, and Commissioners. My name is Jacqueline Scarin. 
Chi of Ackerman LLP on behalf of the applicant, Ravi Management LLC, for the rezoning and text amendment application located on the eastern portion of Block 331 in Astoria between 35th Avenue and 36th Avenue on 12th Street. The site is currently zoned R5, and the applicant proposes to rezone the eastern portion of the block within R6A and C13 overlay. All of the uses within the current rezoning area are non-conforming uses, including warehouse, storage space, a, switch, a switchboard factory, and auto repair uses. The site is located directly across the street from NYCHA's 38-acre uh, Ravenswood houses, which uh, range in height from six to, to seven-story residential apartment buildings. To show some of the existing conditions, um, this is the development site right now located at the intersection of 12th Street and 35th Avenue. There is little to no pedestrian experience here. Um, it's literally a construction uh, fence and there is only about 10,000 square feet of floor area that's used for construction equipment on here right now. Um, the rest of it is mostly scrapyard and it's directly across the street from a, a major residential complex. These are other, some other views of the site. In addition to the rezoning application, the applicant seeks a zoning text amendment to designate the project area mandatory inclusionary housing area. Um, option two is proposed by the applicant. However, we are mapping both options with um, the opportunity for the local council member to select either option one or option two. The proposed project will be a new eight-story mixed-use building with 14,000 square feet of retail space on the ground floor. Uh, the uses are, are currently not known, um, although the applicant is looking at a mix of local retail and possibly a larger retail space for either a supermarket or they were actually looking at a restaurant. Uh, the development will contain 74 residential apartments, of which 22 will be permanently affordable through the MIH program. Um, and there will be 71 accessory parking spaces lo located both at grade and within the cellar of the building. Uh, this is just a site plan. The residential entrance will be located on 35th Avenue and there will be retail entrances on both um, 12th Street and 35th Avenue. And the applicant has also committed to working with HANIC, which is a local okay, nonprofit organization we'll be speaking. <laughs> Thank and you. Questions? Questions for Ms. Gurnchy. Commissioner Delos. Actually, just two, two things. Um, one is, I'm just wondering, I, I noticed um, that on the fence of the site that there's um, there's information, I guess, is, has there been a, a community-based organization that's been involved in helping to maintain the fencing on the site and message to the community? You know, that's a good question. I, I have to get back to you on, on that one. I'll ask the owner. Um, okay. I know that the owner is currently leasing it to this construction storage company, but um, if the rezoning is approved sure. on there, likely, but it is an interesting question. And, and how, how, long, how long has the owner owned the parcel? Um, they just acquired it uh, two years ago. Yeah. Okay. And do they have other uh, parcels in the area that they've redeveloped or owned? Not specifically in the Astoria neighborhood, but they've developed other parcels um, throughout Queens and the five boroughs. Okay. And if I may just ask one more question. Um, so I know you said that the plan is to map both option one and two and let the council member choose, um, although it seems like the developer's preference is option two. That actually just came out of um, Council Member Van Bremer's preference on other projects um, to do 30% because it reaches a wider range of incomes. Like you can have 10% of the unit because it's an average at 80. We can have 10% at 60, 10% at 80, and 10 uh, probably up to 100. Um, but you know, we did recognize that the community board um, was saying that they would rather see more of the affordability at 60% AMI. So um, 
at this point, we are open to recommendations on the affordability levels here. Great. I mean, I would obviously, um, you know, considering the affordable housing lottery will be based on um, the preference at the community board level, um, you know, it would be helpful. Uh, and, and I'm sure the, there's quite a range, but with public housing being so close by and wanting to ensure that um, a greater percentage of folks have um, from public housing and the surrounding area have options, um, I think certainly the depth of affordability is often something that, that people desire. Yeah. Commissioner Efron. Uh, I think Commissioner Delos was hinting at the fact that this artwork may be uh, community, um, have community benefit, and I would hope um, that you could get back to us about what the plan is to make sure that um, the work is respected in some way, um, and uh, if there is any history there, it would be useful to know. Um, I assume you don't know it now based on your previous answer, but I just want to echo that. And then, um, has Hannock worked with this developer before, is one question, and the second question is whether Hannock has done work directly in the Ravenswood, uh, Long Island City, Astoria neighborhood. The applicant has not worked with Hannock before. It was actually a recommendation through the community board um, because they do have a lot of local experience. And um, Paolo Duran from Hannock is actually going to testify this okay. afternoon. So. Great, thank you. Okay. <laughs> this is Commissioner Levin. Uh, yeah, I have a land use question, and that is um, about the area that you have um, chosen to propose for the rezoning being basically the eastern half of the block. Um, I note that the rest of the block um, similarly has um, industrial uses on it, um, make it not that much different than the area you've chosen to request for the rezoning area. I wonder if you gave any thought to an application to rezone the entire block, um, and if not that, why you chose the long, skinny eastern end and not the, um, you know, the northern half. Because this rezoning puts, um, creates a split lot condition. There's one of the buildings to the south of your client's property that is a full block, I mean, through the block right. um, facility. Right. And this would put, mm -hmm. this uh, would put a, um, create a split lot condition for them. So can you just talk to us a little bit about the um, analysis that led to this particular proposal? Sure. Um, all of the sites uh, on the eastern portion were viewed as soft site, potential soft sites for um, their underutilized sites right now. They're auto repair shops and were seen as sites that were ripe for redevelopment. Um, and also 12th Street and 35th Avenue here are wide streets. I, I do recognize what you're saying about extending the entire block. We we were looking at this eastern portion as being directly adjacent to the Ravenswood houses and having the connection there, um, and also trying to avoid spot zoning um, to have a, a, a rational connection um, along 12th Street. We can also, at the post-hearing follow-up, have department staff also address the, yeah, I the rationale. Yeah, that, that'd be a helpful. I mean, certainly, this yeah. this is a this is a rational application, and it's. I certainly understand that your um, your client really only seeks to get their own property rezoned, but you understand, as we do, that yeah. this needs to be a well-considered plan. Um, right. And I realize that the property immediately to the west, I guess, that is not proposed to be rezoned has a pretty similar use to some of the other properties that are within the area. So yeah, if we can have a further conversation with staff about that and follow up, I think that would be well, great. Other questions? Well, thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker in support is Paola Duran. My name is Paola Duran. I'm the Director of Housing Development for Hanek. Uh, on behalf of our team at Hanek, I'm here to voice our support of the rezoning application uh, being presented by Ackerman LLP on behalf of Ravi Management for voting by the Commission. 
HANAC is a non-profit organization founded in 1972 in Astoria, uh, and it is a city-based social, social services and affordable housing development organization that provides a wide range of programs and services, most of them in Queens. We actually run and operate the Ravenswood uh, House Senior Center there, so we are very familiar with the area. Uh, Hanak now owns and operates three full-service uh, senior residences that consist of 350 units in Astoria and has currently under construction two affordable housing projects, one in Corona, Queens, and one in Flushing, that will add 300 units for low-income seniors and families of the city. Hanak is fully committed with the development of affordable housing, um, and we support any efforts towards that goal. Reason why Hannah will be working with Ravi Management in order to act as the managing agent for the MIH units of the project, approximately 22 units uh, as presented on their proposal. Hannah's role will be uh, to do the marketing and management agent of these MIH units. Uh, Hanax has been working in Queens for decades, and we are aware of the housing needs in that specific area. Reason why we really support the application uh, for the proposed rezoning that will allow the development of more MIH units. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Duran? Yes, Commissioner yeah. Delos. Yeah, on Thanks for being here. So uh, it's great. I didn't know that you all ran the, the senior center at Ravenswood. Um, based on what you know of area need and perhaps any lotteries that you've done for mm -hmm. the community board recently, would you, um, what do you think of the community board's recommendation for option one versus option two for MIH? Yeah, so I th we can say it's very divided, especially when we were at the community board uh, meeting here and all of the community members. I think what they really want is to see a range that you can always offer, not only for the lower levels, but also low and middle. So that's what I think the, develop, the, propose, uh, the proposal is looking uh, to have an average, just to do not close it to the lowest, but just to have a range. That's the sense that we have based on the lotteries that we have done and taken into consideration what you were saying before about the Ravenswood uh, public housing. That's something that the community really, they raised that at the community board hearing that we have uh, because they want to have the opportunity to apply for any MIH units that are in the area. Uh, there are other things to consider because some of those tenants are living in NYCHA, they have other type of subsidies, uh, so we will have to explore really what the preference will be for this project, but I think the sense is to have a bigger range and average the MIH uh, uh, units for this, for this proposal at least. If I may, yeah. I, I totally understand that that's often the desire. I guess my question as well is, given your experience with lotteries in the area, um, does the, where is the demand greatest? Um, and, and perhaps that's part of what the project can help address. Yes. So I think because this is going to be a family project, it's not going to be 100% senior, uh, I think the average income will be benefit the, the proposal. So I guess option two will be beneficial to the project. If this was only senior housing, I think option one will be better for the project. Thank you. Yes. Other questions? Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker in support is Tahira Adams. Good morning, Chair Lago, Lago and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Tahira Adams, and I'm a security guard at the World Trade Center. I'm speaking today on behalf of my union, 32BJ, to express our support for the proposed project at 11-14 35th Ave. As you know, 32BJ is the largest property service union in the country. We represent 80,000 building service workers in New York City, including 1,366 workers who live and work in District 26. It is our estimation that when opened, this building will be staffed by approximately five building service workers. Wave Management LLC has committed that these jobs will be good jobs with families, sustaining wages, and benefits. These are the types of jobs that give New Yorkers dignity and access to mobility. In addition, we are glad that this project will create much needed, permanently affordable housing that our members and worker, worker families in Queens could benefit from. We urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Questions? 
Thanks. So that is the last speaker that we have on this item, um, unless there is anyone else present who wants to be heard. <laughs> we notice the chairs in the back of the room. Um, this public hearing is closed. <laughs> Borough of Queens, calendar numbers 45 and 46. Calendar number 45, CD1, 180174 ZMQ. Calendar number 46, C180175 MMQ. A public hearing in the matter of applications for a zoning map and city map amendments concerning the St. Michael's Park elimination. Our first speaker in support is Jose Lopez. Good afternoon, um, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Jose Lopez. I'm the Deputy Director of Parklands for the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, which is essentially the real estate division for the Parks Department. I'm here today to present to you an application by the Department of Parks and Recreation and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services for a city map amendment and also a zoning map amendment related to St. Michael's Park and Queens Community Board 1. The project site is located where you see the word park in there and is generally bound by Astoria Boulevard to the north, 30th Avenue to the south, and to the east is bound by the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. And then on the west, you have St. Michael's Cemetery. The area is generally residential in character and includes uh, multi-family um, residents. The area to the west is St. Michael's Cemetery, and then to the northeast, where you see the M1-1 Manufacturing District, that area is um, a commercial area that has big, big box retail stores such as Home Depot. And then just directly southeast of that area, it has one family and also multi-family residents. And then on the western side, um, boring St. Michael Cemetery, is a manufacturing district that has warehouses and um, a store that sells um, construction materials. So the uh, zoning map um, amendment is basically to establish a zoning district within the park parcel that is being eliminated. As you know, zoning designation does not apply to map parkland. So once the parcel is the map, we will establish um, an abutting um, zoning district, which is R4 zoning district. The project site was acquired by the city of New York on April 1st, 19. 41, and it was established at the time map as park for park purposes. As you can see, the um, parcel is irregular, and it goes on, on the north from Astoria Boulevard all the way down to 30th Avenue, and is located along the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. The project site has never, never been programmed for the, um, park use, and, um, and Corny is landscape. And this is some photos of the project site. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> nice move getting the photos up. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Efron. I just wanted to confirm that the parkland, the triangle to the south, um, is not part of this application. Um, it's not on this one, it's on the correct. first slide you showed. That's yeah. uh, correct, that's um, <laughs> a, an active um, playground that's heavily used um, by the community. Vice Chair Knuckles. Jose, good to see you. Likewise. Um, I believe it was the community board that had set forth uh, some conditions that they wanted to, uh, I don't have them right in front yes, of no, me. Yes, I, I, I could speak to them. Yes. So basically the um, alienation legislation, which was approved on the chapter 399 of the laws of 2015, which uh, authorized the city to alienate uh, the parcel, require that, in this case, the, the requirement is that the city obtain as compensation equal or greater than the market value of the parcel. In there, it states that the funds to be used for park improvements within C, uh, CD1. The community board preference is for the funds to 
uh, in Queens, I'm sorry, so in Queens, the community board preference is for the funds to be used within CD1. And the Parks Department position is that we will strive to work with the community board and the local elected official to identify a site within CD1 you know, that will receive the funding for park improvements. Was that the only condition? Well, there was others, so I could speak to, to whatever you like. So one was um, requiring that, you know, that we consult with CDDOT, so the intersection, I'm sure if you can see that area that I highlighted is like in red, close to Astoria Boulevard. So the community board asked for us to speak to CDDOT regarding the city retaining that area because the, uh, in, in their view, the ramp there is um, is kind of um, um, it's kind of tight. I mean, in terms of uh, of the space. So as part of the O agency review that was conducted by city planning, city duty was consulted and they had no comments. And then also the Department of Environmental Protection was consulted. And in, in response, they issue a letter. They actually have a 48-inch water main in that area. So they're actually re requesting for the city to retain an area that is approximately 40 feet in wide, uh, uh, 40 feet wide, where it's facing Astoria Boulevard, and then to a, a depth length of 80 feet. So essentially, the city would not be disposing of, of that area adjacent to that corner. And um, make sure I cover everything. And then another um, request from the community board uh, was that, you know, at once the city, if the city were to dispose of the, of the parcel to St. Michael's Cemetery, is that the property line between the BQE and um, St. Michael's Cemetery be landscaped uh, with, with trees, and also that there'll be some fence that is, um, not just a regular chain link fence, but uh, something like a wrought iron fence, and St. Michael's Cemetery has committed to make those improvements as part of their future project. I mean, they, their plan is to use this area for additional burial grounds. And yeah, I believe I mean, the, the other thing was you know, the, community, the community board wants uh, for parks and the council members to be consulted. And as always, I mean, you know, we, we, we will consult them because basically we're gonna use a fund to undertake park improvements. So as part of a capital project, we we'll consult the community board and the council members, so that will be standard. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you so much, commissioners. Our next speaker in support is Edward Horn. I'm just here, madam, for answering questions representing St. Michael's. Is that speaker there, Mike? Oh, okay. Any questions for the representatives from St. Michael's? Okay, thank you. And um, our next speaker in support is Eric Palatnik. Hi, Eric Palatnik. Uh, I'm representing St. Michael's in a private capacity as I'm working with Jose from the Parks Department, who's been the lead agency, and they've been fantastic. I'm available to answer any questions, but I also wanted to add one more point. Uh, since you are making a, uh, acting on an application to take parkland and, and really hand it over to a private applicant, you should know the nature of the private applicant at St. Michael's is really more of a public open space. I don't know if you're familiar with the cemetery, uh, but it's very similar to what we all, I think, are very familiar with, is Greenwood Heights Cemetery. Uh, which is really has a reputation more of a beautiful place to go as a public open space. Uh, it's the same thing here. They have uh, many events that are open to the public. Scott Joplin, there's just an article in the Times over the summer about Scott Joplin, who's a very famous ragtime musician I didn't know anything about. They have a grave site there for him, and evidently everybody in the ragtime world comes out and parties at his grave site, and, and they encourage that, uh, the partying part of it. They really do. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's uh, So the park, even though we are asking you to take parkland and hand it over to a private entity, uh, you should rest assured that we are taking defunct parkland, that if you've ever driven the BQE across from the Bulova site on your way to LaGuardia, you probably didn't even know it was parkland, and we're taking, nobody ever goes in there, it's not really accessible, and you're taking that and giving it to them, and uh, in exchange, they're gonna continue to keep the community open, the whole property open to the community at any time. This is really is uh, absent the, uh, the, the deceased uh, people that are there. Uh, it's a very peaceful, calm, uh, wide open space. So that's my whole comment. 
Thank you, that's a very helpful additional information. You're welcome. Questions from the commission? So you Vice get Trump. no complaints about noise? <laughs> For the party? No. We get no complaints at all. They can do whatever they want, nobody complains. They build, they bang things, nobody complains. Um, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. So those are the only speakers who are signed up on this item, um, unless there's someone else who would want to be heard. So this public hearing is closed. Borough of Staten Island, calendar numbers 47 and 48, calendar number 47, CDs 1, 2, and 3. C180302 PSR, calendar number 28, I mean 48, C180303 MMR. A public hearing in the matter of applications for the site selection of property and a city map amendment concerning the South Shore of Staten Island Coastal Risk Management Phase 2. Our speaker in support is Garrett Berger. Hello, uh, my name is Garrett Berger and I'm from the New York City Parks Department and I am here to discuss the second ULIP application in support of the South Shore of Staten Island Coastal Storm Risk Management Project. This is an Army Corps project. Um, it, this is the second ULIP in support of this project. The first was to acquire and site select existing city owned properties and we came before the commission uh, and at the end of at the beginning of 2017 for, for, the, for that ULERP. Um, for this second ULERP, we're proposing to site select existing city-owned properties or properties intended for transfer to the city by the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery, um, and then also to demap streets that are crossed by the proposed seawall or on the water side of it. And our co-applicants with parks are DOT um, and DCAS, and we've also coordinated with ORR. Uh, this is the project, Army Corps project area. It extends from Fort Wadsworth to Great Kills Park. Um, the red line shown there on the map is the seawall. Um, it, it actually is an armored seawall, uh, buried seawall, excuse me, from Fort Wadsworth until where you hit the waste or treatment plant in the corner uh, near Great Kills Park, where it transitions to a flood wall. And then from there, it transitions to an earthen levee. And that entire facility is referred to as the line of protection. Um, it also includes drainage areas, um, road raisings to, to provide access to the top of the seawall, and then an enhanced wetland. So I'm just going to skip through a couple of these. I had too many slides here. Um, so as I said before, we're site selecting 48 lots. Um, 43 of these are Governor's Office of Storm Recovery, lots intended for transfer to the city. That totals 13.1 acres. And then we're demapping 11 sections of street bed that totals 21.5 acres. This is all primarily in the Oakwood Beach section of Staten Island. Um, th these properties are surrounded by vacant land or park land um, and uh, at, once and, and the demapping and site selection of these streets will not impede access to any uh, homes to remain in private uh, ownership at the conclusion of the project. Um, this map here shows the site proposed site selections. The yellow is the the streets proposed for site selection, and the lots are the red. These streets are primarily unbuilt. Um, and then this map here shows in the red outline the streets proposed to be demapped. Um, and again, these are primarily unbuilt, and, and you'll see that purple line is the seawall, and, and we've, we're demapping streets that are crossed by that seawall or, or on the water side of it. Um, we presented this application to three community boards in Staten Island, all three community boards. Uh, we received unanimous support, um, also re recommendations for approval from the borough board and, and borough president. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that the commission may have. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Cirillo. Gary, thank you. I, I'm just going to start at the beginning with, the, I just have a couple questions, but uh, phase one, What's the status of the acquisition of the properties from phase one? Has the city acquired all of them at this point? No, so I'll speak to that a little bit. So we received approval to acquire uh, 21, 24 lots and one partial lot. Um, and since that time, a couple of those properties were acquired by GOSER. One was acquired by a Build It Back buyout program. And then three, actually, um, USD NRCS uh, and the Nature Conservancy acquired th three of those. And they're, we're working with them right now. To, they're donating them to the city. Okay. So 
the, the, the amount of properties that the city is actually working on acquiring has been reduced somewhat. And for those remaining, uh, I think we have 17 properties and the one partial that are what remain. Uh, we are currently in the appraisal process with DCAS. So DCAS is working on uh, appraising those properties uh, currently. Um, and then for the streets, we also had received approval to acquire 13 street beds. We did title searches on those streets, and as it turns out, only two little bits of those streets um, are, are, are privately owned and are going to require acquisition by the city. So that has been reduced somewhat as well, which is good news. Okay, well, a lot of information. That's yes. great, Gary, thank you. Um, <laughs> so so well, I guess we can just say that things are moving ahead as hoped. That there, is there is there yes, a the, delay the, in the process? I guess that's the question. If they, they're not, if you're not completed yet in this process, is that a problem in terms of the timeline that has been established? No, no. The, okay. the, the, the city is on track. Um, you know, with our we're responsible for the real estate, and and we still uh, expect to have all the real estate acquired by the time the Car Army Corps goes out to bid for for the project. Okay, good. And and maybe you can answer this question just from uh, obviously you're from Parks and not the Army Corps, but do we know? And and I don't know if anybody from the Army Corps is here, which I can ask the question later. What is the expected timeline for design for the line of protection? Mm -hmm. So we're currently in the pre-engineering design phase. Um, the Army Corps, they brought on their consultant for design. Uh, we did a, a site visit with them. Um, their engineers have been out in the field inspecting all the parks facilities that are inspected, ex expected to be impacted by the project. And then um, we've also, the, the, the big effort now is going to be doing the borings, the geotechnical work and the hazardous material investigations. They're all set up to do that. Uh, all the city agencies, all the property owners have issued their rights of entry so that the Army Corps can go onto the project to conduct those investigations. And we expect them to begin this month. Um, and okay. once they start getting the results of those, they'll feed that into the design. I think that's where we'll, I, actually, I don't think, I know that's where we'll start getting the more advanced, detailed design from the Army Corps. And, and will the design be brought back for some discussion or reveal to the community? Yes, um, and they are also going to need to to the communities. Yes, I'm not actually sure if the Army Corps in their in their process if they're required to return to the community again. But certainly, you know, uh, the the parks and the city will be back to the communities to discuss the project. Okay. Okay. And I guess my final uh, follow up on that is you, you talked about uh, the design and the need to reach out to sort of impacted. You know, at least you mentioned parks properties. The, the one, this is sort of a, you know, this goes through many different types of issues in terms of the, the whether it's a built environment or it's just the natural environment, but on the sort of, um, I can go to a different closest map. to the, yeah, go back. I just, I just want to point out, yeah. I just wonder, I guess the general question is, has there been any discussion or what is the impact that is foreseen, if at all, at the South Beach end? Uh, for the restaurant on the boardwalk. The, the Since that's really the only thing that's along the beach on the boardwalk. Yep, so I'm also... That took parks. a long time to get to, you know, exist and is obviously really enjoyed by the community and others. So I just wonder how that plays into the design and, and what discussions, if any, have taken place with them. Mm -hmm. with the so concession. the Army Corps is, their, their goal is to minimize impacts to any existing facilities when they site the, the sea with the actual seawall. Um, we don't know yet still what the impact is going to be to the Vanderbilt. Um, the Army Corps said that, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll know this after they complete their geotechnical investigations, the Army Corps has said that that if the structural integrity of uh, the Vanderbilt is jeopardized by the construction of the project, that will come down. The, and then as part of the project, the Army Corps will have to rebuild an equivalent facility that, and, and will of course be closely coordinating with the Army Corps on the design of that facility. And, and because we're certainly interested in seeing existing conditions replicated such as, you know, access at grade to the, to the boardwalk to be reconstructed atop the seawall. Sure. I mean, obviously, if that impact is not avoidable, then, you know, clearly there needs to be some time and and serious discussion on the impacts for the business owner who yep. currently has the right to be there, um, even if it's a concession, you know, or some lease arrangement there, because mm -hmm. it is on the boardwalk, and I understand that. But I, I, I do... 
hope and expect that there will be some discussion and it will not be a surprise. Um, they need to be a part of whatever the discussion De definitely. is. Definitely. And so far, they've been included in our discussions. Good. Thank yeah. you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, I was just at that restaurant last week, and it really is an asset. Um, uh, one question, um, how, there, there are two sort of important um, corridors, at least defined by, um, you know, the Chamber um, of Commerce, which recently did a study um, in the area, Midland Avenue and Sand Lane. Um, and I'm curious how those two areas, the connection to the beach at both of those places will be critical to supporting and enhancing um, the businesses along those corridors. What happens at, you know, the this place where Midland hits the beach at the location of this um, levee? Mm -hmm. So, um, as part of the project, there will be access uh, to the top of the seawall, which is where there'll be the boardwalk or promenade, and then over to the beach side at, uh, at all major intersections with the, with the road. Um, there'll be regular access points, both NADA accessible access, access points throughout the line of protection. So for clarification, these are two of those major access Yes. Points. And actually, Parks has undertaken a shoreline parks land um, effort to sort of uh, think critically about how we're going to be adapting our parks to, to, to this project, and in that project, we've we've sort of focused on these major nodes in Midland uh, Avenue and Sand Lane are, are two of the ones that we've also identified. And Midland Avenue actually, um, you know, we're, we're proposed, currently right now, even though it is a major corridor, the entrance to the beach is, is sort of a secondary one. Um, and as part of the plan, we propose to concentrate amenities at Midland Avenue and have that be a more major um, access point to, to the beach. What do you mean by amenities? So recreational amenities, I mean, it's a conceptual plan at this point, but it could include things like adult fitness, um, you know, a sports field, uh, a dog run, um, just d d a wide range of, of recreational amenities. Okay, great. So you're saying that in addition to the resources for the levy, there will be resources available for some of these amenities um, behind the levy, or so in we're still of, looking for money? For we're still looking for money. Um, in, in terms of anything that's going to be impacted, existing facilities to be impacted by the levy, that'll be replaced as, as, as part of the project. Um, but for anything new, you know, that's we don't have funds for that as of yet. Okay, but but as part of this, will there be signage and wayfinding um, to direct folks to the places where you can go over the levy? Is that part of what comes with the, the resources for the levy itself? That's a good question. Um, we haven't talked to the Army Corps about whether they would provide wayfinding. Um, it's certainly something we can talk about them with, you know, during our long series of negotiations to come. Um, certainly, you know, that's something we can, we can explore further. It would make a, a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I imagine it's part of what people are thinking about, but we'll just, you know, flag it for consideration. Thank, Thank you. you. Other questions? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you are there any other uh, speakers on this item? If there are not, then the uh, item is closed. Hearing is closed. Madam Secretary, do we have any other matters before us today? No, Chair. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Vice Chair Knuckles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yep. Sending off my son to school. Was he going to college? Yeah. Where's he going?